Hi everybody and welcome back to the Durham University Engineering Department podcast. As always, my name's Sam and I'm joined today by Karen Johnson uh, and you'll hear much more about what she does at the university coming up very shortly. Um, so for any students, Karen, who have just started out at Durham, maybe haven't come into contact with you yet, could you give us a bit of a flavour of where students can expect to see you either over a Zoom lecture or hopefully soon as part of a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction? You know, what part of the uh, taught course are you involved in? Uh, yes, thanks Sam and thanks very much for interviewing me. So I teach all about sustainability to all students in your third year. I don't get so much to do with first and second years unless I'm involved in design, which uh, thankfully sometimes I am. Um, but I'm in the civil stream as well for polluted environments and sustainability. So you see a lot of me in third year if you're a civil student and some of me if you're uh, on all streams. Fantastic. So yeah, I was a civil student myself um, and those, I think those courses were, were the envy of a lot of my peers and some of the other streams, they were really, really interesting. Um, but for someone who came in like me, you know, I certainly didn't expect to enjoy them as much as I did coming in, you know, someone might say, you know, why am I learning a bit about things like soil, perhaps, you know, expecting that would be something the geography students like cover. Why is that so relevant to engineers? Oh, that's my favourite question, probably. Anybody <laughs> who gets my lectures knows that I'm passionate about... Ah, uh, you can see, I haven't forgotten yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's not glamorous, but it does underpin all life. And I'm also passionate about sustainable development, and the two marry together. We, we learn in Materials 3 about the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the UN's global challenges, things like end poverty, end hunger, and address climate change. And soil health is in there and, of course, underpins all of those things. So directly in terms of food security, also it filters our water and uh, it stores our water. So we have flood resilience and drought resilience. And one of the things that is less well known, I suppose, are the links between soil and climate change. But there's a very strong link because soil is the second biggest store of carbon after the oceans. So apart from fossil fuels. Uh, it, it stores our carbon and it's not doing a great job of that at the moment because we haven't been looking after our soil. So that's what my work's about at Durham. I'm working with many other people in the Sustainable Infrastructure Research Challenge and across the university and the country and the world to try and get soil pumped up policy agendas so that we actually do look after it and then we can address the global challenges. And that's fantastic. So someone like me that who maybe was going to work in civil engineering how should I, in my day-to-day -day life, either in design or in the contracting side, think about soil and, and, and go about protecting it? What sort of things should industry be doing? Yeah, that's, that's another excellent question. It, there's a lot that, sustain, that uh, civil engineers are doing, and that's because in sustainable development full stop, we are kind of the people who generate the most waste understandably because we're, we're dealing with the biggest products, you know, buildings and construction and demolition waste. Indeed, yeah. Sources of waste. So there's a big movement um, which is being promoted by the Institute of Civil Engineers to just stop and think, do we actually need a new build? Do we need a new structure? Can we refurbish? And, and it's quite a mindset change because, of course, us engineers want to build things and, you know, change the world through built infrastructure. But we're, we're sort of pausing to think about what that infrastructure is actually delivering, the service that it delivers, and whether we can do it more sustainably. So I'd say the biggest thing that you as a civil engineer can do is to, is to sort of join that movement. And um, there's, there's many people, uh, including the institutions, as I say, who are championing that more circular economy approach, which fits in with the stuff that you learn about materials three. Absolutely, yeah. The second thing is that it comes back to soil is that uh, civil engineers are more and more learning and, and pushing the boundaries at how to work with the natural environment instead of building on top of it, which is what mm. we've been doing for many decades. And, and that's kind of it's not really the fault of the civil engineers. You know, we didn't really know the importance of soil or appreciate the importance of soil organic carbon, which is the glue that holds soil together and provides many of the ecosystem services like water storage and carbon storage in soil, as well as plant growth, obviously. Um, and now that we do understand that, then obviously it's our duty as, uh, as in the universities to be teaching people about that, which is what we're trying to do. 
and uh, as practicing civil engineers to just sort of question, you know, you guys are going to be the leaders in 20 years. Hopefully. So, yeah, you, well, you will be. And you, you've got these global challenges to address alongside us people who, you know, will be moving to one side in 20 years. So it's, it's understanding how to maintain and enhance soil organic carbon so that we can continue to deliver fl flood resilience and carbon storage to achieve things like net zero by 2050 at the latest. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you very much. It's a great insight there. It's obviously an, an industry you've been involved in for quite a while. Have you noticed a big shift in thinking in the industry since you joined? Is this something that's become more important? Obviously, there's still some way to go. Yes, there is. And, and Durham has been actively involved in, in changing that landscape as well, because working with other leading institutions like Birmingham and, and Leeds and Newcastle, we've, we've been very active in working with policymakers and getting the soil health inquiry launched, which was launched when the UN Sustainable Development Goals were launched as well in 2015. And that soil health inquiry was a government inquiry which started to look at these issues that I'm talking about. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting time to be working in soil. Now you're perhaps being quite modest when you talk about government policy. I was reading yesterday that in 2016 you were part of the government's environmental audit committee. Can you tell me a little bit more about that day and how that came about? Because that found really fascinated me. Yeah, so that was a really exciting time. And um, the Soil Health Inquiry, we'd been talking to the Environmental Audit Committee for several years, working with several chairs, all of who are MPs, of course, and it's kind of one of their jobs is to run these government select committees to look at important issues. And they became interested in the work that I was doing with some other uh, colleagues at, at Durham, uh, David Tall and Charles Ogard. Uh, and Claire Bambra, who's now at Newcastle, mm. it was an interdisciplinary project where we were looking at the effect of contaminated land on communities, as well as coming up with engineering technologies to try and remediate the land. And one of the things we discovered was there was a big link between ill health, public health, and contaminated land. Yeah, and it, it was quite a, a stark correlation that uh, we couldn't get to the bottom of the causation because it's such a complex issue, but it was quite clear that there was a, I think it was about 15%, you were statistically significantly more likely to become unwell um, with some sort of lifelong limiting illness if you lived in an area that had more brownfield land. And we had of course taken into account all the uh, arguably more important, or certainly what we thought were arguably more important factors back then, um, which were things like income and um, uh, diet, et cetera. But now, interestingly, looking back on that, that's how we got the, the Environment Audit Committee hooked because that link with public health. Now, looking back on it, we see that we've got the, um, the Lancet Chatham House Commission, which will report to the government on a COVID recovery, how to get out of um, economically, how to recover from COVID. And that Lancet Commission is looking at the links between environmental degradation, full stop, and public health. And when I say environmental degradation, it includes contaminated land, it includes, of course, habitat loss, which is, is linked to pandemics, but it also includes climate change, marine pollution, it's all environmental degradation. And then the public health doesn't just include COVID, it includes all sorts of diseases, because there's a lot of upcoming evidence that not just particulates from pollution, for example, are bad for our health, we read a lot about that in the paper every day, but that... Um, that there's a lot of immunodeficiency diseases like diabetes and, um, and other very significant diseases like cardiovascular disease are linked to environmental degradation um, and uh, pollution. So that was how we got them interested was the public health agenda and, and getting cross-examined by, um, I won't mention the MP, but um, uh -huh. the, the MP who gave me a really hard time in the inquiry was was quite an experience definitely so interesting, we our interesting. Ground, our ground. that's fascinating thank you for speaking to me about that so um would you say that getting that fish hook of public health how, how important was that to sort of get people talking about soil it it was crucial and i i was lucky to have a network of people working alongside me in our, in our network that was called a nation that destroys mm. its soil destroys itself people like sarah dack who works at public health england and people at the environment agency uh, people at the land trust um and uh, we were a network of people who were you know saying the same thing to the environment 
of our environmental audit committee. So I, I think that's why that, that message came across is because we had public health experts, not just Claire Bambra, but Sarah Dack, who actually spoke at the, uh, the parliamentary event where, where the Soil Health Inquiry was launched. That's fascinating. I had no idea it was so current even today with COVID. Thank you for talking to me about that. Um, so outside the UK then, I've been reading also that you're lucky enough to do some fascinating research overseas uh, with people far away in Zimbabwe. Obviously, you talk about a country who, who's not looking after its soil, is not looking after itself. Um, would you say those problems are perhaps worse in countries that are perhaps less able to? in sub-Saharan Africa, for example? It certainly has a bigger impact in those countries because food security is that less um, uh, secure. Um, but the, the other big issue with, uh, with continents like Africa is that across Africa, there are many sandy soils, which are okay. very poor in organic matter and very poor in nutrients. And that's purely because they're so old. Um, they're absolutely ancient, those soils. And of course, where soils get their inputs of organic matter is from rivers, flooding, natural processes, uh, mountains wearing down and weathering, but that generally happens with water flow. Mm. So because they're so old, they haven't had fresh inputs of um, those minerals. And it's the minerals that can actually stabilize the organic matter. So in, um, that's, that's one of the reasons why they've got it worse than us. Of course, all around the globe, um, for agricultural soils, we've got the issue that we've been using um, chemical based fertilizers, which we know now are um, had a big, big impact on destroying the soil microbiome, which is at the heart of soil health. Um, and in addition to using those chemical fertilizers, which of course have allowed us to feed the world, but now we're kind of past that peak mm -hmm. feeding the world and we're looking at the consequences. Um, the other issue is that we haven't been returning organic matter to the soil. So because we've seen wonderful crops growing with this artificial nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium additions, which are derived from fossil fuels, of course, then we didn't think to add organic matter in many cases. And again, with organic matter being at the heart of soil health, allowing soil to hold on to water, um, which is important for drought resilience in, 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 in many countries in the global south, and important for flood resilience in many countries in the global north, as we're well aware, then again, we're suffering the consequences. Fantastic. Could you touch just a little more on how those connections emerge with, you know, uh, ac academia in sub-Saharan Africa? Because that fascinates me. You know, how, were, how have you been able to, to build those bridges and those connections? Yeah, well, um, that's because of the wonderful fund that um, we have and but it's very much under threat and this is very relevant at the moment we've just as an institution written a letter to our uh, research funders and um, we're hoping to get a letter in the national press as well about the fact that the global challenges research fund is being slashed and it's to do with the fact that the overseas development agency fund has has been cut um, but the gcrf funds are all about the global south working with the global north and instead mm. of the ODA budget going to aid, um, uh, it, it went to research and the research was about co-producing solutions for um, that would work for the global south and the global north and, and it's been really working very well and obviously there's so much to be learned both ways, it's, it's, a, it's a very genuine partnership. But as I say, that is under risk at the moment. So that's how it came about, the GCRF funds, which have really started some fantastic collaborations across the world and, and, and benefited all partners in, in whatever projects I've seen and helped us to address the, the, the sustainable development goals. Yeah, that is really sad to hear that is under threat. And I wish you all your best in, in your fight with making sure that stays current. Um, moving back to the UK then, you're from the North East yourself. How interesting would you say is it to work in an area like uh, the northeast of England, uh, where our soil and water, you know, uh, situation is quite unique. Um, how, is that something that the Durham course focuses on? Um, we do do a lot on um, mine water. It's a very big issue in the northeast, but it's also, of course, internationally relevant because mm -hmm. that's where we get all our resources from is is mining. So there's an awful lot of case studies that we can look at in the Northeast, and we do in fact do that. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, we're certainly not unique, you know. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 the environmental issues that we look at in the Northeast 
and in fact the economic and social ones that go hand in hand with those that are, are all around the world. Oh, I can certainly imagine that's really interesting. Um, did you find because uh, you, you did have done some of your studies down south and then and then again up north obviously working with Durham and Newcastle um, is it different to be a hydrologist in the south of England and, and then areas in the north as well or is it applicable both ways? Oh no it's very different because the the, the source of water um, down south is um, is is groundwater and up here it's often surface water so yeah mm -hmm. wholly different issues we have a little bit of organic matter in our water that you see in the weir at certain times of the year it running brown um and um down south i remember being working in, in the chalk and the scheme that i was working on 20 years ago was a, the in, maybe 25 years ago was the <laughs> alleviation of low flow in in some of the the chalk streams which are very ephemeral and it's just really sad when you have a beautiful stream babbling brook um that's there in the winter and then it's gone in the summer so and that was largely due to abstraction of groundwater of course um which of course we needed public water supply but it was trying to balance that with the with the natural ecosystem so if students are trying then to take what they learn and apply to you know the world they see as they walk around Durham, if they do see the weir is running a bit more brown, perhaps a bit less translucent, what does that mean? Does that mean it's less healthy? No, not at all. It's 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 part of the natural process. So it's coming from the the peat uplands. So the colour is from dissolved organic carbon, mm -hmm. and um, the, the, that's going out to the sea, of course, to become marine carbon. And uh, so it's nothing to be concerned about, but it, it, you hear. wouldn't see that brown. You wouldn't see that brown water if it's running red. You need to ring up somebody and tell them. You know that means the pumping schemes that are keeping the mine water <laughs> levels low have, have failed. So no, brown is not a problem. Now you do occasionally see that, especially around the bottom of the bailey. You do see that occasional little bit of red um, coming from somewhere. You know, running especially off off those river paths. I know a lot of students enjoy uh, exercising in. I've certainly found Durham a really interesting place to uh, to learn about this. Uh, in our lectures as well. Um, as we move away then from things like mining in the UK, um, what sort of you know impact, lasting impact has that had? You know, a lot of people would think that learning about mining would be you know sort of redundant. Now it's, it's in the past. Why do civil engineers still need to consider things like mining, especially when it comes to watery wastes? Yeah, I wouldn't say that we are completely moving away from mining. There are pockets, you know, in, in Cornwall where we're looking at, uh, at mining again, and we always will need resources. What we've got to get better at is making sure that we try our best not to dig up anything toxic. We don't mm -hmm. work with toxic elements because they're, you're always going to have pollution and you're always going to be damaging the ecosystem and that we get better at minimising the impact of mining. So I, I wouldn't say, you know, we, we need to move towards more... Um, sustainable mining um, technologies and that sounds like an oxymoron at first but of course we need to work with the resources we've got and the waste we produce we need to get maximum value out of that because it's going to be a lot less energy intensive and hopefully less polluting to work with that material than it is digging a new hole in the ground um, but in terms of the legacy your question the, the pollution that we do see, which we can deal with, with things like iron oxyhydroxides, they're, they're very useful, these things. We just need to um, uh, prioritise um, reworking them into the soil instead of just leaving them in a pile, a dump yes. somewhere and landfilling them. All of the things that come from the ground are returned to the ground in some shape or form, but we're not optimising those waste products we see them as the minute as acids but basically those are the materials the minerals that we need to rebuild our soils and and, and that's our mantra now is a nation that rebuilds its soil rebuilds itself so but the legacy of those iron oxides coming out of the mines etc goes on for for centuries even um, millennia because we're talking about geological strata and the, the, the amount of sulfides, for example, which is, is one of the source of the iron rich uh, water that you see coming out into the weir. Uh, there's, there's, you know, millions uh, uh, and billions of tons of that underground. Mm. And so with the fluctuating water table reacting with that with oxygen, then it uh, oxidizes it into the acidic waters that we see um, occasionally coming into the weir. Now you talk about uh, pollutants being acidic there as well as toxic. Um, just for the students listening who might not necessarily know, you know what the, what that means. How 
how different is it to treat a water that has, you know, physical toxins in, as opposed to the water being either slightly acidic or, or dangerous in this way? How does that change how you would treat water in that way? It's really important because if you have a low pH or in fact a high pH, which is much rarer, we might see that around the constant steel works though, where mm -hmm. we've got a lot of free, free lime in the wastes. Uh, the, the low pH, um, which is what acidity is, means that we are damaging the ecosystem. And so fish and plants that grow in the river are not gonna tolerate anything um, lower than six is the guideline, but okay. certainly lower than five because it's the logarithmic scale. So we have to treat it some way by raising the pH. And there are passive treatment systems that can do that, that are not using too many chemicals and energy. But sometimes, of course, we need to use chemicals and energy in order to make that water fit for purpose uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. So yes, the acidity, I always, you remember from the lectures in level three in polluted environments, pH is the master variable. And Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, because it leads to mineral dissolution and, um, and then often those minerals are where the potentially toxic elements are immobilized. And if you dissolve the mineral, then the arsenics and the leads, et cetera, are free to move around in the water and then more damaging to the ecosystem. Interesting. So it's, it's the case that, you know, if your water is already, you know, subpar and that it's acidic, it might actually get worse with more toxins as well. That is something that is really interesting. Um, is, is this something that we need to focus on? You know, a lot of people would think this wouldn't be, you know, this is something that can't, an issue we need to focus on when it comes to drinking water. Can you explain a little bit more about why this is so important, even for water, the water that we're not planning to drink, but we're just discharging it into the open? Yeah, why do we need to treat the water running through our rivers, for example? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And all the legislation that we have that we've adopted since Brexit, the European legislation like the Water Framework Directive is, is moving us in the direction of all of our rivers being of good ecological status. And it's because, of course, water is the fluid that sustains life. It's mm. quite a unique molecule, water, and, and because it can be present in the three different phases within a relatively narrow temperature band. And, and we, we, we need good quality water to have every organism that is important, it, every organism has a contribution to the ecosystem to have a healthy environment. And, and, and coming back to the point that we started off on, I think the links between environmental degradation and our health, mm. um, it's not just a value led thing that we should have a nice ecosystem and look after other species, plant or animal. Um, but it's it's also comes back to bite us. And, and I suppose that's the key message about sustainability and why I'm so passionate that all engineers, all students, in fact, and, and there's we've recently mapped all the sustainability that we teach across every module in the university, undergraduate and postgraduate. And we're excited about talking about that more this summer. But for engineers in particular, because you guys are the guys who go out and change the world, you know, and and you're in control of the processes, the industrial processes. It's really important that we understand that um, we have to come up with solutions that aren't just cost effective, but are enhancing the environment and um, enhancing society. And of mm. course, we can do that. We're, we're, you know, there's a there's a very capable generation out there, and uh, it's yeah, it's exciting to work with you guys. Certainly, a big yeah possibility for solutions to come forward there. Would you say that in in your time? Uh, studying this it's been as much discovering new solutions as, as as well as discovering some of the problems as well you know we, are we moving towards now where a lot of the research is based on finding solutions to problems that we know exist or are we still finding new problems for soil and, and water that we don't know about yet I think that it's kind of still unfortunately early days for for example technologies that um address net zero in soil. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of the research has to be focused now because soil is the biggest store of carbon. And that's where the engineers come in, of course, because we transform that uh, natural environment into the built environment. We need to maintain that healthy natural environment. But um, I think that, what was your question? What had changed? Yeah, so, so, so in terms of looking at, um, you know, it, I, I often see research in, you know, the people who research the problems and the people who research the solutions. I think a lot of our viewers might 
think that when it comes to sustainability in the environment that we know all of the problems and we, now we just need to come up with the solutions. I was wondering in your time of research, you know, how many new problems are still cropping up even before we've solved the uh, solutions that we know about? I think it's a bit of both. I think you're really right. There's, you know, it's, there's a very much an understanding that we kind of know what to do, the transition mm -hmm. to renewables, and we're making great progress, you know, in, in the UK and uh, in many other countries as well with moving towards renewables. And of course, that's what, you know, our department is, has got particular strength in. But as I say, coming back to soil, I would say that although we're coming up with solutions of how to hold water in soil and engineer soils, optimize them in order to hold water, carbon storage, we're, we're kind of realizing that we're, we're not quite there yet with mm -hmm. um, that. There's a lot of understanding still to be made. Um, and, and, I, and I have seen a big, a big development over the last 15 years that I've worked at Durham now where um, there's been an acceptance of sustainability and it's becoming embedded um, across the um, various courses we, we, we teach about it. And I think that's just going to grow. And, and that it's that knowledge and skill set, particularly the ability to listen to other disciplines, um, the, the, the ability to work in an interdisciplinary fashion, no matter what field you mm -hmm. go into, but particularly in engineering, that will allow us to apply the technologies that we've already got, as you say, and make progress on the new ones. Because you can't make a solution, you can't come up with a technology without involving the stakeholders who are going to use it because, you know, yeah. we're all human and, and we'd just be like, well, you know, I don't think that's a very good idea. And, <laughs> and, and you need to be involved in co-producing that technology for it to be very successful, you know, so there's the psycho psychological aspects as well. Yeah, no, the, the strength of being multidisciplinary certainly is really important. Would you say that, you know, one of the strengths of Durham University, certainly I think, is that they... Uh, I, as a student, have been given elements of knowledge in chemistry, knowledge in business. It's not always so engineering focused. How important is that for the engineers of tomorrow, that they are very knowledgeable in many areas, not just their mechanical, civil, aeronautical discipline that they choose? I think it's essential. And we're seeing that, of course, we, we have many industrial partners um, and we talk to them. And that's what they want in our students as well, because this generation, your generation, Generation Z, are um, are very keen to tackle the global challenges with with you know my generation support. But it's you guys who are going to you know live with them for longer. Let's put it that way. And everybody knows that to solve the global challenges, we need let's put it this way, kind of the four faculties. If we keep it Durham focused, we don't just need science. Clearly, we need technology, but we need to work with the social scientists. We need to work with business people, of course, to make it cost effective. But we also need to work with arts and humanities people because what changes people's hearts and minds is the narrative and the story. So we've become very aware of that, I think, as engineers, that um, you can't just come up, as we say, with a technology without involving stakeholders and, and not just involving their mind, but their hearts as well. Fantastic. Yeah, it's certainly problems to be excited about solving as well as being worried about you know affecting our lives for sure as, as an engineer at least um, you speak about Durham being you know being a course which is you know quite forward thinking here and having quite a few advantages could you go into a little bit of detail I know obviously changes are coming this summer about what makes you perhaps for some prospective students what makes Durham strong in areas of sustainability yeah, I think that um, we've been talking about this in the, uh, I'm the chair of the University SDG group, Sustainable Development Goal group, and our priorities are to educate and engage all staff and students on the Sustainable Development Goals, and to better showcase what we're doing around the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as helping us as a community to live the values. And that, um, that middle one, better showcasing what we're mm -hmm. doing, I think is what we're working on this year um, because we do do a lot around sustainability. There's a lot more to be done and there always is and any institution will tell you that. But we're trying to, um, uh, well, we're, we're discussing at the minute, excitingly, the Climate Action Toolkit, which is developed by um, an organization, an alliance of universities who look at sustainability and climate action. Of course, we signed the SDG Sustainable Development Goal Accord in 2018. 
but um, I think what might differentiate us from other universities is that we are small but beautiful uh, and so we are able to deliver interdisciplinarity with a sort of four faculty approach so you'll often find people talking about sustainability when you come across it in your course that they're very close to others from the other three faculties and so they have um, in my experience when I work with these people they have quite a nuanced understanding of the fact that all four faculty disciplines as it were um, broadly are needed to address the global challenges so that that's what I'd say to prospective students to Durham is, is come here because you'll learn a the, the, a wide range of skills, depending on what modules you take, obviously, but we will be um, this summer showcasing that mapping project that I mm. talked about, where we've mapped all the sustainability knowledge and also skill sets um, that are required to address the 17 sustainable development goals. We'll be, we'll be showcasing that at the minute, it's an Excel spreadsheet, not very <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> We'll be finding a way to, to best showcase that so that people can see what we're doing. That's fantastic. That's, thank you for explaining that for me. Now, something else that I find that Durham had quite a strength in, when I came uh, to Durham in my first year, um, I was given a copy of a book called Lean In, which I believe is something you had uh, something to do with. Could you explain a little bit about the initiative where everyone in my year was given a copy of that book and, and what that means for the department? Yeah, that was kind of a, a very much a Marmite, <laughs> as you might remember. So we still have those copies uh, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens to them. It was, it was, we were trying to raise awareness of gender um, issues, the fact that there aren't enough female engineers in engineering, as we all know, and it's such a difficult challenge to address and, and nothing's changed, to be honest, in 20, 25 years. We had Chia Mwara, the local MP for Newcastle, come to talk to us about it five, six years ago. And she's been interested in STEM and gender for a long time now. Um, so we bought the book Lean In by Cheryl Sandberg, who was, I don't know if she is still the, the chief operating officer at Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a contentious book now as well, because um, that issue of um, uh, gender imbalance in STEM and all subjects has moved on a little bit. The, the main thrust of the book was the fact that um, women in our culture feel less inclined to put their hand up and shout, oh, I won a prize, you know? And, um, and, and uh, so that in itself is sometimes a contentious issue because it's sort of looking at, what, what could you say, sort of stereotypes between men and women, but there's no hiding the fact that there are fewer women going into subjects like engineering. So the reason why we bought the book for everyone was to get them talking about the subject, and it mm -hmm. certainly did that. Um, and some people loved it, and some people really didn't like it. So we've we've moved, and I think now we talk about gender and other ethical issues as well in, in the same role. I think there's an essay that we write in first year or a presentation that we give, because, of course, there are lots of issues as well of gender that we have to introduce engineers to. But uh, we still have the copies of the books if anybody would like to borrow one. Yes, I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear that not everyone loved it as much as me. I found it a really, really good read and a lovely to receive a bit of free literature as well. Um, I think well, the thing I gained from the book most, um, certainly when looking at my peers and that I became more educated on, is that I was perhaps naive in my first year to think that any women who had, you know, successfully made it onto my course, I think it's, you know, between one and four and one at five at Durham, um, had sort of made it and were okay. Whereas what I realised reading the book is that even once women who got into a course at Durham, uh, say say 25% of the people in engineering, it's not the exact number, but say it was 25% uh, female, uh, that if you actually look then at the numbers of people who took team leadership roles, who um, applied for scholarships and bursaries, applied for academic awards, it would be much less than that figure of 25. I don't know whether that's something you wanted to touch on at all. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. And I think that some of the issues that we see within subjects, including engineering, that don't have a good gender balance are some of the same issues that we see in organisations that do, don't have a good diversity as well in terms of BAME, because really you need lots of different perspectives, not just, you know, um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, male, female, you need different, all sorts of different cultural perspectives as well as gender in order to come up with the most creative solution mm. 
and to challenge yourself and get yourself outside of your echo chamber. So of course, that's why Durham, you know, is appointing a, a PVC in uh, EDI, quality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and why we take this issue so seriously and every organization with any sense, of course, does, because we want to be creative and we want to come up with the best solutions. And gender is just part of that spectrum, really. Um, so, yeah, and of course, it's one of the sustainable development goals because it is Absolutely. in the education of women all around the world and not not having uh, females in engineering to the same extent as males means that we're missing out on all that talent when we're short of engineers full stop it's just you know that's why it's such a big issue for engineering in particular. No that makes an awful lot of sense um, you are someone of course who's lucky enough to have worked with a very diverse field of people we were speaking earlier about people you'd worked with in sub-Saharan Africa so would you say you've certainly felt the benefit of you know reaching out outside an echo chamber and, and getting opinions from not just different genders, but all over the world. Absolutely, which is why I love working um, internationally because, um, and, it, and it's been quite enlightening this year, actually, thinking that we don't need to, we don't need to fly to see these people. There's networks <laughs> yeah. and ways to see people. So we've all learned that. But yes, I, I, learned, I learned the most by working with people who challenge my perspective, definitely. That's fantastic to hear. Um, we've spoken a lot about uh, your time in academia. Just perhaps then, for people who are in my position, you know, looking looking forward from their degree, um, I think I'm right in saying you worked a little bit in the water industry before returning to academia. How would you compare the life of working in academia or, or working for a private company? It's it's very difficult to um, to uh, compare it directly because it's so radically different. You know, the reason why I'm in academia is because I, I, I learn through teaching. I always learn something every year I teach. And um, I, I learn through my research and I advance research. And, and that's very, it, it can be long-term to having an impact. Whereas if you wanna mm. go out and have an impact and we were talking about moving away from the idea of building things automatically, but you know, make people's lives and environments directly better quite quickly then you know that's i would say that's the the, the world of, um, of 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 a consulting engineer if you want to look at the long term strategies then you need to either be a politician or or <laughs> yeah Megan, some people might argue with comparing those but they're they're all longer term should be longer term agendas of course politicians are every five years but the the think tanks and stuff are, are longer term and and research is about is, is, is about the long-term goal of thinking ahead and thinking how society can be better. Just for you personally then, did you always have in the back of your mind that you'd return to academia? Um, or, or, or did you give the private sector a go and decided it wasn't for you? I did give the private sector a go and decide I want to be a student again. <laughs> oh no, it. I might be in your situation <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, but I, it, research piqued my interest because I came back to the northeast having worked down uh, down in London and and loved it. But I came back for family reasons. My my mum wasn't very well, and then fell in with the local uh, hydrogeologist because I was a hydrogeologist who happened to be a leading academic at Newcastle University. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, Paul Younger. Um, but he he inspired me. He was an inspiration to many people. And uh, I started my PhD and I, I never looked back. That's fantastic. That's brilliant. And, and then what, what eventually brought you to Durham? You said you uh, returned to Newcastle University first. We're obviously very lucky to have you on our course here. Um, yeah, what brought you to Durham and, and what sort of differences did you see for the better or worse between the two departments? Oh, that's a contentious question. Oh, yeah, I'm not listening, looking to dish any dirt, perhaps. <laughs> Nothing wrong with either city. I, I'm very, um, very lucky to have the job that I have. And, and, and you'll see uh, it's much more competitive now than when I got my job. But academia, when you do know you want to be an academic, you go where the job is. And I was fortunate enough that there was a job that really suited me because they were looking for an environmental engineer with some ideas about soil um, and, and water. And so there's an awful lot of, um, uh, of serendipity about with these things which is why you can plan all you want your career and I, and I would advise it to have a little bit of a strategy for the you know five ten years in the future but it doesn't always work out like that and you have to take the opportunities where you can. 
Absolutely, yeah, not looking back and looking forward sounds very sensible indeed. Um, looking forward for your own research here at Simon and Diamond then, could you give us a little bit of a, obviously don't give too much away, but give us a little bit of flavour on what you're working on, on at the moment, difficult in COVID of course. Um, what is your main focus of research right now? Yeah, so I, I'm very excited about um, about finding new methods to work with soil and um, because I don't have the same access to the lab as I used to and particularly thinking about how to store carbon in soil and deliver flood resilience and uh, carbon storage. Uh, I'll show you what I'm working on. Please, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Lots and lots of these all around my house. So this is a terrarium, which is okay. basically that most of them are smaller so that I can replicate them. But it's basically a container, which is the official title is materially closed, energetically open. It's like a jam jar, which is sealed tight and the atmosphere is sealed, okay. but of course sunlight can get in. So you can study the biogeochemical cycles, carbon, water, nitrogen, everything. And I can effectively, when I get access back into to, to this kit, which will be soon now, um, actually at Newcastle University, I'll be able to count the carbon atoms um, and um, and look at the stability of the carbon and whether it's in the very fast turned over uh, carbon pool or the much more longer term, the slowly turned over, which um, is exciting because that means we're storing carbon and uh, addressing climate change. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, that, that's what I'm working on. Oh, I'm really pleased to hear you've been able to continue that even working from home, hearing about people working from home during COVID is fascinating, but that's a really good example there, even having those in, in your house, that's fantastic. Um, for some current Dartmouth students, then obviously, you know, getting students interested in research is something the department is really focused on. Um, do you have any final year project students yourself and, and, and how will you be able to work with them and what are they looking at at the moment? Well, that's a good question. They'll laugh when they see this because we have lots of terrariums set up in okay. the reception area. But unfortunately, because of COVID and because of the, um, the second the, no, this third lockdown, we weren't able to get back in and access them. Excitingly, their project has, uh, in my opinion, taken a, a step in, in, a, in an even better direction. But let's see what they have to say about it. <laughs> because they've moved to looking at global soil organic carbon um, storage patterns and linking it up with some of the experimental work we were doing, which is using minerals like iron oxides, manganese oxides to stabilize the organic matter and they've looked at the correlation between iron and uh, clay minerals around the world and soil organic carbon and um, it's more of a sort of systematic review of the literature but addressing where the research gaps are so I'm very excited I'll get their drafts in today I think. Yes indeed perfect timing well best of luck to them all that sounds really interesting. Um, how important is that final year project to a student at Durham Center, their second or third year looking at as this big scary deadline because I think a lot of people myself included see it as a real highlight of the course you know can people really look forward to this final year project is it something that you'll be proud of leaving university with? Absolutely we see people getting the best marks and we um, uh, that's because they've done so well it's their baby you know they've put their heart and soul into it um, whether it's experimental computational systematic review as I say more literature based which is, is rare but um, it's a very exciting opportunity to really get passionate about one thing in a lot of detail. And we often see the 10 page report that's produced at the end being converted into some sort of publication, sometimes an academic journal publication, sometimes more industry focused. And I think a lot of students maybe also think, why are we writing an academic <laughs> paper type uh, article? But what I always say to them and um, and, and, and I really believe this is having worked as a consultant myself and the sort of reports I produced then because that was just the norm and the sort of reports that I see coming from consultancies even to this day, they are big and you're only really going to read the executive summary, which often is two pages in itself wow. um, and the conclusions. It, they've really, we could do with taking a leaf out of the academic journal paper writing style where it's you know 10,000 words, 7,000 words, very to the point and um and also putting it in the context of why what you've done who cares you know why is it relevant mm. and it's relevant because this was a gap you know in, the, in from the point of view of a research and development project and but it links to what smith and jones have done in this way what you know 
um, Whelan and, and, and so and so have done in another way. It's, I think it's a really great skill that you get as well as um, your, um, your passion at the end of the final year. No, I'd completely agree. So you, you'd say for anyone who's sitting there worried that any work they've done at university so far, you know, is a problem that people have solved a hundred times before. By the time you get to your fourth year, you'd say that you, you definitely do something that contributes to, to engineering and that, that will be read by other people outside of Durham even. Yeah, definitely, especially if it gets to that published status. And, and I think one of the assessment criteria, we've just changed it recently, I would have to double check, but talks about it's got the potential to be published. Um, uh, thinking about it, we might have just changed that criteria, but we have wording that means kind of the same thing because we do see many of our standings, our students producing outstanding work that really needs to be read by other people. Oh, that's fascinating to hear and good luck to any students who are listening who are taking part in that research at the moment, especially in COVID times, that is difficult. Um, I think that's pretty much all the questions I have for you today, Karen, but thank you so much for joining us. You've been a really, really interesting guest and even though I was lucky enough to enjoy all of your lectures last year, I still keep learning the more I talk to you. So thank you so much for joining us and um, yeah, see you soon. Thanks so much, Sam.